Amen. Thank you, Bell Choir. Well, good morning. And to welcome the Watkins United Methodist Church. We are so glad you are here this morning with us. My name is Rob Tucker, and I'm, of course, blessed to be the lead pastor here at the church. I also want to invite, uh, invite those who are joining us online to leave your names in the comment section so we know you're worshiping with us, whether live or on demand. If you are, are new or visiting with us, there is a Connect card there found in your pews. If you're in person, if you're online, that is on the front page of our website. Click on New. We'd love to just get to know you a little bit. Also, for all folks, on the other side of that Connect card is a prayer request uh, form. If you'd like your pastors to be in prayer for you, if you'd like the congregation to be in prayer for you, I encourage you to fill that out. Um, turn it into an usher as they come by or, or somebody on their way out, and we'll make sure that you are prayed for in that situation. Asking now that you will stand as you're able and join with me in this morning's call to worship which of course you'll find on the screens and in the bulletin in front of you. Lead a life worthy of the calling to which you are called. Lead a life worthy of your calling, a life filled with service and meekness. Lead a life with re, which reflects your calling, a life of peace grounded in the Spirit. We rejoice in our oneness in Christ. We share the grace of our Jesus. Live a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. We gather as God's family, ready to sing and to serve. And in that same voice, we'll sing together this morning's opening hymn, Be Thou My Vision, hymn number 451. Let us sing. standing as we read this morning's affirmation of faith, which is a statement of faith of the United Church of Canada. Let us pray together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. shall be world without end. Amen. 
I invite you now to take some time to greet those around you sharing signs of peace. Is it on? Yeah, it's on. As many of you know, I'm Sullivan, and I'm on the Board of Trustees. Our street sign is a vital asset to the church and is the first impression to the local community. Obviously, there are hundreds of potential members that pass in front of our church every day. As we know, a sign is supposed to send a message about happenings going on within the church. The sign complex also projects an image of the church. When you look at our sign, especially at night, what kind of image do you think it projects? The trustees have unanimously voted to approve the rehabilitation of the sign complex and installation of an LED message sign. The goal is to attract new members. During our research, we came across a fellow United Methodist pastor who installed an LED sign at his church. This video is an, is an endorsement of an out-of-state sign vendor. We will be using a local company. However, the goal of the video is to show how an LED sign can have a positive effect on a church such as ours, Watkins.
So there you have it. I think that guy did a great job of explaining the benefits of an LED sign. As you can see on the screen, you can see our current sign and our hopefully potential new sign. The flag at the bottom of the screen would be the location of the LED sign. And as you can see, we're going to uh, install a custom made aluminum United Methodist cross and it will be in the correct location. We, we estimate the existing sign structure is approximately 40 years old and it's starting to show its age. It needs tuck pointing and mortar repair. It actually has a big crack down the back that needs replaced uh, or fixed. I have a printed handout with all the details of this information if anyone is interested. I've got those out in the back in the welcome area if you would like one afterwards. The total investment for this project, which keep in mind is our image, is approximately $21,000. We hope to raise the funds within the next three to four weeks and hope to have the project completed by Christmas. But I have some great news. We already have $4,000 in commitments to this project. We're starting our fundraising campaign today. The thermometer that we had for the painting project will be located out in the lobby when you leave and you'll see it to the right and it's going to track our progress, progress as we go. So here's my final thought. Many of us have been members for years here and when we will be here for many more to come. As a church family, when you see that beautiful sign, you can take pride in knowing that you helped create a positive first impression of Watkins. Thank you. I invite you to be in a spirit of prayer. Gracious and loving God, before you again, we, we again bow our heads in reverence and momentarily close our eyes to shut out the distracting world. Thank you for calling us to prayer and for hearing us when we do pray. As we approach another All Hallows Eve, we again join your faithful followers in acknowledging you have knit together your elect in one communion and fellowship 
in the mystical body of your Son, Christ our Lord. Grant us grace so to follow your holy saints in all virtuous and godly living that we may come to those unspeakable joys which you have prepared for those who sincerely love you. We particularly thank you for the saints whom we have known and who have been a blessing in our lives, relatives, friends, fellow church members, and others who come to our individual minds. As Holy Spirit so direct our living that after we also receive our eternal inheritance, those left behind will remember our kindness and our obedience to your word and will. In this sacred place and hour, may we sense your presence and give close attention to your word in scripture, song, and sermon. Bless and inspire all musicians, teachers, preachers, committee members, custodians, and all else who are not named. In our better moments, we know that you call us to separate tasks, but into one common body, the church of our Savior Jesus Christ, by whose teachings we pray together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In the New Testament book of Philemon, chapter 1, verse 6, the writer says, I am praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. As a reflection of God's grace toward us, we believe that growing in generosity is an important part of living and becoming more like Jesus. Our offering time in worship is an opportunity to expand and express our gratitude and generosity, be it for the children's home, for the regular ministries of this church, for our outreach near and far. Let us worship now as the ushers wait upon us and as we utilize the modern technology of online giving through Church Center. Let us worship with our offering.
God of unimaginable love, you have given us so much and asked so little. In the words of Jesus, we have been commanded to love you with our whole being, to love our neighbors, and to love ourselves. For that simple price, you've given us everything and promised to love us and not desert us. It's a covenant more generous than anyone could imagine or deserve. So as we dedicate our gifts this morning, may we also resolve to keep our side of your covenant of love more faithfully. In Christ we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Today things will be a little different during sermon time of something that uh, the Reverend Dr. Gene Hawksers has, has, and I have kind of dreamed upon and hope that it will be beneficial for you. Uh, and I'll let her start it out for us today. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, good morning and thank you. And uh, welcome to the last Sunday in Pastor Appreciation Month. Um, I do want to just say quickly that I know that the world is so hurting right now on wars and we're blessed to be able to stop and talk about Pastor Appreciation Sunday in the midst of a world that is in such turmoil. Um, and we, um, we appreciate our pastors here very much. We are blessed to have great pastors and great staff, and because we love them so much, we're not going to mention a thing about yesterday's football game. Okay. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Not a thing. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> but, so have you ever wondered why a pastor is a pastor, how a pastor becomes a pastor? Uh, Rob and I are going to have a little bit of a conversation about a call to being a pastor and what that might look like. Um, and we hope that you will give us some grace because we've never done anything like this before. And I'm very aware that he's way better at doing this sort of thing than I am. But I do also have a call story and I volunteered to share it with you today. And so um, that's what we're going to do. I I'd like to start by reading a passage of scripture from uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, and I invite you to listen for the word of the Lord. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. I hope you heard in that passage of scripture the word calling or call that was shared seven or four different times in several different ways. Um, and, and what Paul wants people to hear is that there is a calling to ministry in the church of Jesus Christ. Um, so pastors have a particular calling, and um, John Wesley saw that calling as uh, both institutional and relational. He hoped that his pastors would help other people develop a closer relationship with Jesus Christ, but always under the authority of the institutional church. And, and that's what we're going to talk about a little bit. Um, but I, a calling is kind of a strange concept, isn't it, Rob? I think it's a super weird word. <laughs> I mean, how often do we talk about our callings in life? I mean, it, it sounds kind of high and holy and mighty, if I may, right? When you start talking about what a, what a calling is or, or what it isn't. So I think it's important for us maybe perhaps look at Scripture and, and see different ways that folks are called throughout it both women and men throughout the, the, the Gospels and throughout the, the, the Old and New Testaments of people receiving a call and acting in ways because God has clearly spoken to them um, that they are called and set apart for, for some sort of ministry. And so the two stories that really come to my mind is first Moses and the burning bush and the calling of the disciples. So Moses and the, and the burning bush is a pretty fascinating story, right? Do you remember from Sunday school? <laughs> that might be the last time that we looked at it was maybe when we were children. Uh, uh, Moses is out and he's tending these, uh, a flock for his father-in-law. And while he's journeying around throughout the wilderness, he comes across a bush that is inflamed with fire, right? And that would make any of us stop and maybe call the fire department at that point and say, what's going on? 
But in his bewilderment, he stared at this bush and said, how in the world is this thing on fire, but it's not burned up, right? It is constantly in flames, but it's not going anywhere. It's not deteriorating. And it's at this point that God clearly speaks to Moses. And he says, Moses, take off your sandals. You are standing on holy ground. And it's throughout that the rest of the story that Moses receives his call and, and God tells him, hey, I'm going to make you do something pretty miraculous. Uh, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh and you are going to release my people from captivity. You are going to go and set free. A pretty immediate call, it feels like. And then we also have the calling of the disciples. And one of the stories in which the Gospels have is this great description of the disciples out on fishing boats. And they're out on fishing boats, and they are just frustrated because they are not catching a thing. Have you done that before? I, I love going fishing. I grew up on a, a marina. My, my parents operated it. And I love going fishing. And there are many days in which I just came up empty-handed, right? And my dad would always say the joke when I came in, oh, I guess we're not eating tonight, son, thank you, you know, <laughs> that's kind of a jest, but they're out there fishing, casting nets, they're not getting anything, and Jesus comes up to the shoreline and says, you know, cast your nets again, and they give this great excuse, Simon Peter, saying, Lord, we, we haven't caught anything, why in the world would we do it? I'll give it a shot, and they cast out their nets, and they pull in so much fish that they call another boat to come in to spread it out, and their boats begin to sink, <laughs> pretty incredible. And it's at this point that God says, through Jesus Christ, follow me and I'll make you fish for people. A kind of big dramatic callings, aren't they? I and mean, They're kind of direct and, and, and I, I hate to put myself in their shoes, but I try to. And I just think, does God speak that clearly anymore, right? Have you heard Jesus say, hey, go fishing and you're going to catch a lot of fish? I wish Jesus would tell me that. Um, or have you came upon a burning bush lately that you didn't have to call the fire department on? I mean, our callings could look very different, but I wonder if, if God still speaks in that way. And I think that would be helpful for Jean, share a little bit about your calling with us, um, particularly where, how, how you grew up, maybe, and then uh, maybe perhaps why you're called to a thing called the United Methodist Church and what that looks like today. Sure. Um, thank you. Of course. Um, I'm one of those people that was blessed to grow up in the United Methodist Church. Uh, I grew up at Centenary United Methodist Church in Shadyside, Maryland, and it was there that I rolled underneath the pews during the hymns, much to my parents' dismay. And with my siblings and my cousins, I was baptized there, and I was confirmed there, and I uh, was corrected there, and I was loved there. Um, it, it raised me. and. I am blessed to have grown up always knowing that God was with me mm. and that love was with me. Um, however, I had never experienced a female pastor. So that was nothing on my radar screen while I was growing up. And it wasn't until college uh, when I, I met the Baptist chaplain. There are Re good Baptists out there. There are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Reverend Judy Bailey, who was just remarkable in every way. And I wanted to be like her. Um, so it began this thing in the back of my head that, you know, maybe... But um, I was a good girl, and I did what my parents wanted me to do, and I became a teacher. Um, and Warren, Ann, and other teachers among us, kudos to you all, because I was not good at it. <laughs> so, um, and, and I knew that, and I still had this thing happening. And so actually one day when I was driving home from work in the great big blue station wagon, I felt this presence fill the car um, and it, it's hard to explain it wasn't a booming voice but it was a, a knowing with every fiber in my being and deep inside of me that that God wanted me to go and learn more so I could do a better job sharing my faith that's what my call was and so it took me about two years but I finally got to seminary um, and it was there that the call developed and um, People around me saw, I guess, gifts in me, and I, I knew I was called to be a pastor. Wow. And so I can't imagine doing anything else with my life anymore. Um, and I have served three congregations in the Kentucky Annual Conference, one with Dr. Strunk, 
um, as his associate. <laughs> and then I was a district superintendent. And now I am blessed to be on the staff of the Council of Bishops of the United Methodist Church, where my job is and my ministry is as ecumenical staff officer. So my responsibility is helping the United Methodist Church interact with other Christian denominations and other religions. Um, and so, so that's kind of my call story in a, in a nutshell. I happen to know yours is a little bit different. <laughs> so. Slightly, yeah, yeah, <laughs> And yeah. it's good for us to kind of share the differences. So uh, tell us about yours. That's right. And I hope in our sharing of our differences that people can also see their story within it, right? And I think that part of this is a conversational piece that my envisioning when we do this, and this was uh, Gene's idea, this whole thing, and so I'm really grateful for that, is that it's almost like y'all pulling up a seat to this table, right? To have maybe, I would love to hear your stories, and, and we'll get to a point like that. My, my call story is a little bit different. It starts when I was in ninth grade, and I had a 10-inch mohawk. <laughs> uh, that was, you know what I'm talking about, like this big old hairdo. Photos? Uh, no, I mean, that's for, for privilege for people only to see photos of that. Um, but it, uh, yes, I had, did have to put about 10 pounds of Elmer's glue in my hair almost weekly, right? And so it, can you imagine your pastor like that? It's just, yeah, maybe one day you'll get photos. We'll make it excitement. Maybe if we raise money for the signs, you'll get a photo, right, of Rob with that. But I had piercings and I had gauges in my ears and I stuck out like a sore thumb in a, in a city called Brooksville. Cities using that lightly. I was, grew up in a, in a bunch of tangerine and orange fields in, in the Gulf Coast of Florida. Small rural town. And you can just imagine that I didn't fit in with the, the cowboy boots and the camouflage. I was instead uh, mohawked and listened to punk rock music, right? But I started to get these invitations because I am a musician to play music in these churches. Uh, and most of the churches, once they found out what I actually looked like, they heard about my, my talent as a high schooler, right, to play guitar and drums and bass. Uh, but once they saw me, you could see a lot of them kind of retract the invitation, be like, we'll put you on the schedule, you know, and I never got put an invitation to the schedule. Um, but this one church in, in downtown took a chance and invited me, and I said, well, I, one, I'm not a Christian, and two, I have a lot of problems with Christianity, and three, I have a mohawk, is that okay? And, and the church said, sure, whatever, that, that'll be just fine. You can still play music, right? I can, okay. So they invited me to come in. And that was the first time that I had ever felt any sort of belonging in a Christian circle. It was the first time that, that I had ever been felt like welcomed for who I am. Um, and even with all the crazy piercings, and, and, and I had a, my favorite shirt was The Clash, right? Do you remember the band The Clash? And that was like my favorite band at a time, so I wore that shirt till it had holes in it and still wore it until my mother threw it away. Um, but I, it, they took a chance and welcomed me in, and that became so crucial to my calling. I went off to college, I went for, as a music major, and, and really struggled with my faith at that point. I had a lot of things that they had taught me the last four years that I really just struggled with. And, and if you know my, my story and the way I present sermons, I have a lot of doubts, <laughs> and I have a lot of challenges, and I am just that kind of person, and, and I like doing those sorts of things. But I really struggled with what I was learning within the college classroom and what I had grown up in those four short years learning. It was a college chaplain who, during my first week, grabbed me. It was the United Methodist College chaplain uh, that said, hey, I want you to play music. And I said, I know the story, <laughs> right? Are you sure? And so he brought me in, and I had all of these questions. <laughs> all these questions about the Bible, all these questions about Christian community. And he was the one that kind of helped foster those questions to say, it is okay to question. It is not okay that's when I actually know you're taking your faith seriously as a part of that. So I, I gave all the excuses, and that's why I read part of the, the story of Moses, because Moses had those same sorts of things. He said, you know what, what if people won't listen to me? What if uh, people don't take me seriously? What if uh, I can't speak eloquently? I grew up with a really, really difficult speech impediment that I go to speech therapy, and when I get frustrated still, I will struggle with my speech, right? I'll stutter and stutter and stutter. And I gave all this stuff, and, and Tim Wright was that, was that pastor, that chaplain, and he just took it all, all those questions, all those doubts, but still very much so pushed me forward. 
I ended up being called to start a youth program when I was in college. And I walked the streets because they had nobody, right? And the youth program ended up reflecting nothing like the church did on Sunday morning. It looked very differently. But it ended up being one of those formational experiences of meeting people where they are and bringing them in to foster a place of welcoming. Now, and then I went to, to, to seminary, and, and, and I did go to that Duke University place, as you probably know, but I'm, the church doesn't teach you lament enough as a, after a football game like that yesterday. But, but I remember receiving this, this cross, and this cross is stained glass, and it is uh, the same color and the same maker who made the Pentecost stained glass window in Duke Divinity School. And the, the fun part about this cross is that it's green, and every class gets a different liturgical color. You know what green means? Ordinary. ordinary time. And I thought, that is just like God to give me the most ordinary <laughs> of things to find. So my calling always comes back to that same time I was invited to come and to play music as a person with a 10-inch mohawk and a bad attitude. <laughs> to create a sense of belonging for people who felt like they didn't belong anywhere, to make the invitation always wider, and the table continues to get larger and larger with no barriers. That's kind of where my story goes. I think we share um, the the desire to pull people in and pull people together. Yes. So, uh, and and there, every day is different, right? And every day is, uh, it's not the same ever. Um, And there are exhilarating and wonderful and exhausting and powerful moments in being a pastor. Um, And uh, like I can remember uh, one time having to ask, this is when I was at Fourth Avenue, a naked man who was using the hose behind the the church building to take a shower in the morning right before worship started I had to go out and ask him to please you know try to cover himself I have um, blessed horses and snakes and chickens and rats and even a gerbil I have served communion to clowns Um, and in my current ministry I have met two popes and I have traveled around the world on your behalf, sharing what it means to be Methodist in the larger context of Christ's universal church. Um, so many blessings. I don't think you can mention uh, serving communion of clowns without some context, okay, okay, right? Okay. I don't think, like, are, are y'all wondering why you would serve communion of clowns too? Okay, so... Um, it was near my first Sunday at Fourth Avenue, and it was a communion Sunday, and I'm down in the front, and I'm being very serious, and um, I had my notes in front of me, and down the aisle comes, like, literally a clown with the hair and the nose and the, the big shoes that were flopping as he walked down, and I was like, don't laugh, don't laugh, don't laugh, and I didn't, and he came forward, and he received, and it... Um, It was a beautiful moment of diversity, honestly, and Harold was with us for several years, and after that, every National Clown Sunday, which is what that was, his friends came and worshiped with us, and he also, uh, they came to his funeral as well, so. Dressed in clown? Yep. (laughs) I've done a lot of funerals in my time. I've never done a clown funeral, yeah. That may be on my bucket list. Uh, meeting, meeting a pope is also on my bucket list, right? And you're going to meet with the pope again coming up soon, yeah, right? Yeah, in March, yeah. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> Did you ever envision yourself hanging out with the pope? Um, well, I don't really hang out with him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like the picture that you do. I mean, you're just like sitting down having coffee with the Pope. Um, no, and in fact, um, that's a part of, of, of what my hope, my message is, that if somebody like me can be ordained, be somebody like me can have a calling, then, then anybody can have a calling. And I feel like we all have a calling in our lives. And um, there's another scripture passage that I did want to share, and that's um, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6 that says this now there are varieties of gifts but the same spirit and there are varieties of services but the same lord and there are varieties of activities but it is the same god who activates all of them and everyone Um, all of us have a calling maybe to be a pastor may not be to be a pastor but there's a calling and i do believe it changes like it has in me over time ours is just to receive and to listen and to live out that calling Um, and i know rob you have been doing a a study series 
on, I think of it kind of as the calling of Nehemiah and all the people that helped him, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. And, and part of this is we're studying Nehemiah on Wednesday morning class, and, and many of y'all are in that. And why the book of Nehemiah? And, and then uh, also, I really love when people ask me, can you preach a message on this? Can you use this? And uh, I know some of our colleagues will, will have a challenge from the youth to say, I need you to sneak in this word for me in your sermon and see if they do it, which anything that makes people pay attention to my sermons, I guess I should do. But part of that is they were like, we think you should try to use Nehemiah in a sermon. I was like, I don't know about that one. Um, but I think this directly connects, and I don't think I would have connected it unless we were in community studying the scripture together, right? So in the book of Nehemiah is about a person named Nehemiah. Nehemiah. There you go. You get extra points from your pastor today. And Nehemiah, it's a, it's a memoir of sorts of, of rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. So they have, Jerusalem has been sacked multiple times. Their walls have been broken down and burned up. And uh, they, Nehemiah receives this call from God to go and to rebuild uh, this city for his people. Now, the, the walls of Jerusalem represent many different things. Sure, it represents security, but also it represents this sort of identity and, and pride of who they are. And uh, Nehemiah is is searching for those sorts of things as well. Security and, and, and safety and, and calling and, and his direct connection with his identity. And so there's this, this chapter in the book of Nehemiah that talks about all the different people that he enlists to help him. Now, I'm not going to read that chapter because I would stumble over every name and embarrass myself, right, uh, as here. But, but what they do is list this uh, pretty incredible list of people that helped put the wall back together. They had people from the, the northern part and the people of the southern part helping to rebuild. They had all different people from, from the local priests to help rebuild, to merchants, to uh, perfumers. I don't know if perfumers know how to rebuild a wall, but they did, right? Um, to different merchants along the way. And they all come together, the piece by piece, the piece to piece. And not only as we saw on Wednesday morning, and I encourage you to go read is Nehemiah chapter 3. It's not only the men that are rebuilding this, but there are also women, right, involved in this rebuilding of this wall to put together an identity together, all from this call that Nehemiah receives from God to piece by piece put this thing back together again. All different groups of people that we would say perhaps are diametrically opposed to one another at some points. All sorts of people that you wouldn't say, hey, they belong together, right? They, they, they are supposed to be included to work together. No, diversity by both age and gender and occupation and all sorts of things coming together to put together a, a, a task that has been set forth in front of them. They come united to do this rebuilding. I wonder for us if we're in that same boat with them. I wonder for us that this is our call as well. Whether we are called to pastoral ministry, how weird and strange and wonderful and difficult the whole thing is, or whether we are called to be the best teacher that we can be, the the, the most caring nurse or doctor that we can be. Uh, calling a special uh, to be a, a mother or, or grandfather, or we celebrated Joe Douth that here to be the grest pa we can be in people's lives. I think it takes every single one of us to change the world. And what I hope you would hear today is that calling is, has this high, and I don't know the appropriate word, and holy word uh, and mantra around it. That sure, there is part of it that I think it is holy. I think it is sacred. Because I think God continues to invite us to take our sandals off. To listen. To respect a a holy ground that I would say is the earth. In which God has created and calls each one of us to be co-creators with that same God. So I challenge you this week. No matter if you're called to be a pastor, a grandfather, a grandmother, a mother, a son, is that you would live fully into that calling. That you would embrace that calling in your life and say, you know what? God, I'm with you on this. I may have not heard you in a burning bush. I may have not been fishing (laughs) at the sea. 
but I am here. And I do recognize you and all. And I want to embrace that calling. Will you pray with me about that? Let's pray. Grace God, we are grateful. We are grateful that no matter who we are, what we've done, or where we come from, you call us your, your beloved child. And that there is nothing we could ever say or nothing we could ever do to make you love us any more or any less. And God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for the tremendous stories of the Bible that helps us to see us in your eyes. We give you thanks for uh, the gift of pastoral ministry, God. We give you thanks for, for folks like Gene up here who have received a tremendous call and seek to live it out to their fullest. And so, God, I give you thanks for every pastor, and there are plenty of them in this room today. We give you thanks for all those who have fully lived in their calling and still call them to live into it even today. Or whatever that special, holy, sacred moments would be, that, God, you give them the courage and the boldness to say, Yes, Lord, here I am, send me. Help us, O oh God, never to see or to miss an opportunity within us and around us to be your people. Help us never to, to ignore the calling and the purpose-filled life that we are all promised and to embrace the peace that comes in which we are fully human and fully alive, found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We ask all of this in the powerful name of Jesus and all God's beloved children said, Amen. Amen. Thanks, Gene. I encourage you to stand, and we're going to sing a, a familiar hymn to many of us. Here I am, Lord. And we're always up here to pray for you and with you if you would like. If you do feel like you have a call to, to some kind of ministry, love to meet with you and talk with you, whether it's here today um, or maybe coffee going forward. I'd love to have that conversation. So let us stand and sing hymn number 593, Here I Am, Lord. I will 
tend the poor and lame. I will set a feast for them. My hand will save. Finest bread I will provide till their hearts be satisfied. I will give my life to them. Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will Now go, in the name and the power of Jesus Christ, who still continues to call women and men into various different places in life, to help rebuild a broken humanity, to come to speak hope to the hopeless, that we may find love always wins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace and peace, my friends.